successful. In order to be truly successful, you have to have absurd fuck off cash, which you're not going to get by being a cog in a machine. You got to own the machine or something which produces goods and services. That way, you don't have to produce anything. Uh, this is too much cancer for me to take. But who's crazy enough to help me with this idiocy? Actually, I have just the guy, but he may not help. Voluntarily. Marginal utility of roads is large enough that forcing people to pay for them at gunpoint is pointless. But don't take my word for it. Just think about it for a moment. If you think roads are valuable, then... What the hell? Uh, what? Hey, what's going on? Why, hello, heretic. Sorry for the violent kidnapping, but you refused to help me the first time I asked for your help with this guy, so I had to take drastic measures. Huh. Well, I didn't know you were into this, too. I mean, I'm flattered you feel this way about me, but I'm not, you know... Uh, no. Actually, I don't. I just want you to help me respond to this video. Ooh, I've been a very bad boy, haven't I? The safe words, Waffle House. Okay, if that's the game you want to play, help me with this video, or I swear to God, I will destroy you as quickly and as painlessly as possible. Um, Waffle House? Safe words don't cut it. Help me respond to this video. Okay, okay, fine. It's not like ContraPoints is making a part three anyways. Hit it! Some people just have it. That wow factor. When they walk into a room, the whole place lights up. They're passionate, driven, goal-oriented, type A personalities. A higher class of human being. Bigger, stronger, the natural winners in our society. More competitive, more successful. Are they just born lucky? I don't think so. A lot of those skills are teachable. The YouTube channel Charisma on Command explains how to give yourself that certain gravitas, stage presence, respect. Now, not all of it is teachable. I mean, you can't learn to be seven feet tall, for instance. And in this respect, yeah, some people are born lucky. But so what? We don't exist in a deterministic universe where one's natural talents guarantee success. One could argue that natural talent makes one complacent, while the underdog is determined to close the gap through sheer skill and hard work, like the tortoise and the hare. Even if you don't become a CEO of a company, even if you don't find yourself climbing up the ladder of hierarchy in whatever business you work for, all of those traits will still ensure that you are reasonably successful. Maybe not successful in everything you want to do, but, but successful nonetheless. You'll be able to live a reasonably comfortable life, take care of those you love, etc. We live in a fallen telestial world, so there's really no way in hell you should expect anything more. We don't live in a deterministic universe. The material circumstances of our environment are not destiny. We have free will. What do they have in common? I've discovered five characteristics of highly successful people under capitalism. And if you follow my foolproof five-step system that I call the slime method, I guarantee you'll be successful beyond your wildest dreams. Note the ridiculous straw man of success he sets up. Aside from everything I've said previously, I want you to take special note of how he views success in a purely materialistic light. He doesn't define success in other ways, like what kinds of things your children remember you for when you're dead, how many people you helped in whatever way, how many times you were kind to the unpopular kids at school, the people you've inspired, the lives you have touched, or lack thereof. I haven't actually seen this far ahead in the video yet, but I suspect this slime method is going to be a caricature of entrepreneurs as Machiavellian sociopaths with chronic backstabbing syndrome. Am I off the mark here? Successful people believe that they can succeed. If you didn't believe that, why would you even try? In order to succeed, you have to believe that you can succeed. Don't just sit around whining about the unfairness of the world. Get out there and bust your butt. You'd be surprised how much of success is about mindset. Simply visualizing achieving your goals in your mind makes you want it, which gives you the motivation to do the hard work in the first place. So yes, continue. 
try to ignore the startling amount of people who die within the same social class as their parents. And it was all sarcasm. This is why Marxists don't believe people can succeed. In their minds, they've already made it impossible. Are we talking about people who struggle for their entire lives to make ends meet? Or people who simply make the same amount of money their parents do, or make less than their parents? Why is that a bad thing? Social mobility means that you have the freedom to fail, or to make less than your parents. Is It's quite possible that my income will never reach the same level as my parents. And I'm okay with that, because unlike you, I'm not a covetous piece of shit who wants to murder people because they have more than I do. Take for example, this study from the Brookings Institute. Reading this with a success mentality means focusing on the fact that real income growth makes the current generation better off than the previous one. Especially in ways that's difficult to measure in dollar amounts, like how you can get certain items for lower prices like food, over-the-counter medicines, cars, high-resolution TVs, gaming computers, tablets, etc. You can just forget about all that. That isn't convenient to your narrative. Median family income for adults who were children in the late 1960s and are now in their 30s or 40s increased 29% from 55,000 for parents to nearly 72,000 for their children, adjusting for inflation. See? Nothing's holding you back from growth. Your whole generation is on an upward trajectory. That means there's no excuse for you. Get out there and make that money. Even if you don't end up making more than your parents, you still don't have a good reason to sit on your ass and whine about how life isn't fair. Well, it isn't fair. It's as far from fine as you can get for reasons I've covered in previous videos. Minimum wage, putting price floors on employment, therefore creating job shortages. Licensing and agency shops, making entrepreneurship and employment illegal, without state or union approval, respectively. Economic restrictions and taxation that reduce real wages by making goods and services more expensive. Huh. What do all of these have in common? I feel like I'm missing something. Like, one very large monopolistic institution that is responsible for literally all of it. Hmm... And the funny thing is, you can't even wash your hands clean from any of that because you yourself have openly supported government programs like PBS and you've also made excuses for bootlickers like the teenagers from Parkland. You can't even claim to be anti-state. Despite you claiming to be an ANCOM, you openly admit to liking the state as long as it gives you free shit. It's frustrating. Boomers telling us that we just have to work harder when they grew up at a time when a summer job paid for their house and you could get a job on your way home from having been fired from the previous job. In this respect, I sympathize because I've been there. But we need to be honest about the actual causes, namely the state. Since Marxism necessarily requires central banking, taxation, government dominion of communication and transportation, literal central planning of the economy, government schooling, and more... Hold on a second. These things already exist and are parts of the problem. Marxism advocates for the causes of the very problem Slimeball is whining about. If he has his way, everything will just be made worse. A failure mentality means focusing on the part of the study which reads, 42% of children born to parents in the bottom fifth of the income distribution remain in the bottom while 39% born to the parents in the top fifth remain at the top. The rags to riches story is much more common in Hollywood than on Main Street. Only 6% of children born to parents with family income at the very bottom move to the very top. According to his own study, a lower percentage of people remain in the top than those who cannot move from the bottom. That 42%? That's still a lot of room for people to increase their incomes even a little bit, not even taking into account increases in the standard of living due to technological advancement making life cheaper and easier. All this in spite of government taxation and economic restrictions directly advocated for by statists, making essentials like food and housing 
vastly more expensive. We're already well aware of the fact that the rags to riches story is actually pretty rare, but to bring that up is a straw man of the whole concept of social mobility to begin with. We already know that 70% of wealthy families lose their fortunes by the second generation and 90% by the third. As the saying goes, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves. So even in our quasi-fascist mercantilist economy that vaguely resembles a market economy, we still have 58% of people who escape from the lowest income bracket and those at the top who plummet. Don't get me wrong, the current system is unjust. Nobody is defending our current levels of economic mobility as preferable. But our reasoning is based on an objective understanding of universal ethics from natural law. Yours is just based on your own psychological flaws and will ultimately result in causing the current problems to be magnified a hundredfold. Now maybe you hear those odds and think, geez, that sounds unfair. It sounds like the system is rigged against me. It sounds like social class is a self-perpetuating and unfair economic hierarchy designed to concentrate and maintain the authority of a select few over the rest of us. But that's a self-limiting belief, holding you back. In fact, anything that contradicts the narrative that you can and will succeed, no matter how unfair or prejudicial the circumstances you were born into, is just a self-limiting belief. It's both a self-limiting belief and it's also a self-fulfilling prophecy. You set the definition of success to be unrealistically high in order to set up a straw man so high that it's something that most people, myself included, don't even aspire to. I define success as financial independence. Slimeball might define it as being a billionaire, and that's fine. Value is subjective, so what he defines it as, well, that's up to him. Your own source even mentions that you have a 50 to 60% chance of either making the same amount of money your parents do, or making more than your parents. Even if you don't, there's the fact that technology is constantly improving, ensuring that you can live a reasonably comfortable life with less and less money. Let's put it this way, would you rather be the richest man from the 18th century, or would you rather be a working class or middle class person from the 21st century? I would pick the latter in a heartbeat. You may not have as much money as the richest people from the 18th century, but in a way, you are most certainly wealthier than they are. Count your blessings and stop whining about how life is so unfair. He's trying to use satire to communicate the absurdity of success in a capitalist economy. Problem is, satire is supposed to be funny. Also, please define capitalism. Any recognition of the difficulties you face is merely a failure on your part to comprehend your ability to transcend them. Nobody says that. At all. You need to have an abundance mentality, not a scarcity mentality. People with an abundance mentality believe that there's enough for everyone and don't begrudge other people for what they have. People with a scarcity mentality believe that other people's success limits their own. <laughs> what are you talking about, Slimy? It's you commies that have starved countless millions to death. It's you commies that constantly talk about how communism will supposedly be a post-scarcity society. Saul Alinsky once said that the price of a successful attack is a constructive alternative, and the sooner you are willing to actually follow this rule, the sooner I will actually take you seriously. At least he admits his Malthusian economics, that there is a static amount of wealth in the world, and that someone else's success must come at the expense of someone else. You can tell he's saying this as he's sarcastically referring to his actual ideas as a scarcity mentality. Like all totalitarianists, Slimeball can't conceive of private industry's capacity to utilize resources more efficiently or create whole new resources. For example, they might get bitter when they find out something like that the top 1% of people own 45% of the wealth on Earth. Why should I feel resentment? As long as they earn that money legitimately through voluntary exchange, it doesn't matter if 10 people owned 99% of the wealth. They didn't do anything unethical. Their success didn't harm me. 
In fact, it probably benefited me, because they sold me a good or service that enriched my life. If you wanted to make the argument that wealth inequality is exaggerated unjustly because of corporatism, then I would agree with you. But the existence of wealth inequality is not itself unjust. If you want to make that claim, then the burden of proof is on you to explain why. Simply having wealth is passive. For someone to have done something wrong, they must have engaged in an action that was unjustified. For example, taxation. So please prove your point. The top 1% also shares over half of the tax burden, at least in the United States. Hell, increases in taxes on the rich is one of the 10 planks of the Communist Manifesto. So will you stop whining now? And 64% of the human beings on that very same planet own less than 2% of the wealth. How many of those people live in communist hellholes or other such countries that rank low on the index of economic freedom? How exactly will implementing socialism in our own country feed people on the other side of the world? It won't. In fact, it'll drag more people into poverty. If some people can't have something, no one can, I guess. People with scarcity mentalities whine about how while successful people get more successful, people on the bottom are going into crippling debt. Well, I've already mentioned how the quality of life for all parties, rich and poor, is steadily getting better, even in third world countries. As for crippling debt, whose fault is that? Their own? Because even according to your own source, vast amounts of money tend to get spent on non-essentials? Or how winners of the lottery end up just as poor as before, if not more so, than before, which strongly implies that they just suck with money and have no idea what to do when they obtain vast amounts of it? And even in the numerous cases when it's not their fault, you have the government monopolizing education and reducing the quality of it and spreading the lie that one absolutely needs a college education in order to get a respectable job, thus ensuring that one has to go into debt in order to receive any actual training in order to go into the field they want to go into. Or when government regulation and socialism has either drastically increased the cost of health care or created artificial shortages in health care, or even both at the same time, or when the state seems to be hell-bent at increasing the cost of housing, cracking down on anyone who tries to produce homes at a lower price, even tiny homes that, while they're not much to look at, would at least ensure that more people can live reasonably comfortable lives. He isn't addressing the real problem. The injustices Marx identified were either directly caused by the state or transient points of economic development we have since innovated out of existence. Most of the problems modern Marxists identify are transient points of economic development we will innovate out of existence. For example, the state. And the extent to which it artificially makes living more expensive. We don't need this parasite. The only reason Slimeball hasn't put forward any alternatives to the current system is to avoid us being able to criticize it, giving him a way to weasel out of critique with plausible deniability. We all know it will bring forward a tyrannical authoritarian dictatorship even more repressive than the late stage democracy we currently suffer under. So how do I know that his ideas will bring forward a tyrannical authoritarian dictatorship if he hasn't said anything of the sort in this video yet? Well, he's a Marxist, I mean, come on. Now, you could work for a living, like a peasant, but that isn't successful. In order to be truly successful, you have to have absurd fuck-off cash, which you're not gonna get by being a cog in a machine. You gotta own the machine, or something which produces goods and services. Kinda like these things? Or anything owned by this guy? Or my personal favorite, this? 
virtually anything you can get your hands on can be used as a means of production with enough creativity. It sure as hell won't guarantee success, but to believe that it would is to uncritically swallow the labor theory of value. Considering prostitutes, both male and female, use their sexual organs as a means of production, does that mean communists must seize penis? That way, you don't have to produce anything. You can pay other people to produce for you. I know, sounds expensive, right? You have no idea if they actually are or not. If there is any division of labor at all, you'll just cry that it's unjust for some odd reason. To succeed in business, all you have to do is pay your workers less than the value they produce for you. This practice is called exploitation, and it's your golden ticket to Richville, baby! What is it going to take to get it through your thick skulls that it's unjust to falsely accuse your employer of robbing you because of something that is completely subjective, like the value of labor? Suppose I was making a documentary video where I interview random people on the streets without paying them. Or suppose I found a voice actress on a site like Casting Call Club to help me with a flash animation, and I pay her the amount of money she has up on her commission sheet, without paying her any royalties from whatever revenue I get from the animation. According to the labor theory of value, I would, e I would be exploiting people in both instances, even though in reality, the interviewee doesn't expect any monetary compensation, and thus doesn't ask for it, and neither does the voice actress ask for any royalties in order for me to use her voice, unless she believes that I would be able to pay it. You'd be surprised what poor and desperate people are willing to do for shitty subsistence wages when the alternative is starving to death. And how often does this happen in countries that have attempted communism or socialism to some degree? Now some workers might have a failure mentality and might start to complain. They might even try to work together to collectively bargain for better pay, safer conditions, or more control over their work. Workers want to get paid as much as possible, while employers want to pay as little as possible. While modern unions in the US are corrupt as hell, the concept of workers getting together to persuade their employers to pay them more is fantastic. This little back and forth is how both parties come to a mutually beneficial agreement. As long as all participants voluntarily consent, it's a good thing. Don't panic. You have options. You can fire everyone and replace them with scabs at an even cheaper price. You can have a huge propaganda campaign with misleading statistics to make unionizing seem like a bad deal for your employees, even though it isn't. In many states, it's illegal to work if you're not part of a labor union in certain industries. How much $700 a year is worth to you is entirely up to you, but personally, I'd rather negotiate my own salary. Buying a new video game system actually sounds like an even better deal than funding a corrupt labor cartel that doesn't give a damn about me as an individual. And that's your prerogative. You can relocate your company to a country with less strict labor laws. Maybe hire some kids. So, in response to all of your unreasonable demands and government regulation, businesses will outsource to people who have less of an entitlement mentality than you do, and even pay them a tad more than what they're used to getting? Imagine my shock! How expensive does domestic production have to get before companies figure that complying with foreign economic legislation and restrictions, dealing with international trade restrictions, shipping materials and goods across thousands of miles of ocean, as well as transporting to the store from port hundreds of miles is less expensive than just producing it in their own backyard. It isn't cheaper at all. Outsourcing is a symptom of the fact that domestic production has become so expensive because of government restrictions that this ridiculous idea of outsourcing is more profitable by comparison. If we cut down the cost of domestic production, it can go away. The simplest way to do that, get rid of the government and let people voluntarily associate. You can work with prison companies to hire literal slaves. Hell, own the prisons too. That's vertical integration, baby. If there was any doubt, if there was any doubt, any doubt whatsoever 
that Slimeball has no intention of eliminating, or hell, even doing a half-fast cutting of the state, dispel that illusion now. So are we done yet? Marxism is so boring, and if I have to listen to any more of this crap, I might fall asleep. Not yet, but we can take a break now. Let's finish this later. Okay, cool. Hey, wait, are you gonna untie me? You'll be back soon, right? Hello? Hello? Waffle House?